we're going to start with the men of Issachar. Uh, but I also began to think about my own journey and uh, my own struggles in becoming uh, the man that God has called me to be. I'm not there yet, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but I thought about the things that held me back and, and the, the ways that I overcame some of those issues. And so I went back to a book I read a long time ago called Wild at Heart. And uh, if you've ever read that, you, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, but So that's I'm, I'm borrowing heavily from that book and also from my own experience. So let's pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, as we begin this weekend, I pray that uh, your spirit would move in the men present. And that you would fill us with a willingness to examine ourselves, to see uh, the areas that we lack, to see the areas that you want us to grow, and to understand those things that are holding us back from doing that. And I pray, God, that by the end of this weekend, every man here will accept the challenge of biblical manhood, the challenge to stand up and be the man that the church needs, that our families need, that our country needs. And we know that we can only do this through your teaching, through your healing, and through your strength. And so, Lord, we ask for all of those things for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, some of you may remember a few months ago uh, at a Buell men's breakfast, I, I mentioned... Uh, some a verse in First Chronicles 12, 32. So that's where I'm going to start, is in First Chronicles. So let me recap that for those of you who weren't present. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. Um, so where we're at in First, Ch First Chronicles chapter 12, for many years King Saul had sought to harm David. David was, of course, the, uh, the prophesied king of Israel. And then after the death of Samuel, David fled for his life with 600 men and their households to the Philistine territory. So David went to live with the enemy in order to get away from Saul. Uh, while there, Achish, the Philistine king of Gath, gave David, David Ziklag uh, at David's request. So 1 Samuel 27, 5 through 6 says this, Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me in one of your country towns, that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So on that day, Akish gave him Ziklag, and it has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. So David and his 600 men move into Ziklag, and that becomes their territory. And chapter 12 in 1 Chronicles describes the arrival of this mighty army. This, and when you read the chapter, and you really think about it, it's just an amazing number of men with skills that just stir my heart. Skills that I wish I had. And so, uh, and, and so these guys are really, really mighty. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read a couple of uh, verses out of, that, out of that text, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. So as we're talking about these mighty men, it says, they were bowmen who could shoot arrows and sling stones with either the right or the left hand. How many of you are archers here today? Can you, uh, well, can you shoot right. either right-handed or left-handed? Yeah. Shoot, shoot a bow. Shoot? <laughs> How many of you are bowmen here today? Yeah. Might be a can bowman. you shoot right or left-handed? Yeah. These guys could shoot right or left-handed. They could sling a stone right or left-handed. A little further on, it says, uh, there were, they were mighty and experienced warriors, expert with shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and who were as swift as gazelles upon the mountains. These are not just ordinary guys we're talking about. A little bit further it says, the, these Gadites were officers of the army, at the least was a match for a hundred men, and the greatest a match for a thousand. The least of these guys could take on a hundred men by themselves. And the greatest of these guys could take on a thousand. Imagine that. That just, that just blows my mind. We're not talking about ordinary people here. We're talking about mighty, serious armies. And then, almost, oh, oh let's see, i got a couple more verses. So, uh, there's, then they start to talk about the numbers. So, 20,800 20, men of valor, famous men in their father's houses. Uh, 50,000 seasoned troops equipped for battle with all the weapons of war. 
37,000 men armed with shields and spear, 40,000 seasoned troops ready for battle. Uh, from beyond the Jordan, Jordan 120,000 men armed with all the weapons of war. So you get the idea. This is a huge army of serious professional soldiers. And they're all coming to help David. And they're coming to help David because they believe that he's the rightful king. And then, stuck right at the end of this chapter, in verse 32, we read this. Of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. What the heck is that doing in the midst of all those other verses? we got this description of all these mighty men, and suddenly you've got this men of Issachar who had understanding of the times, and they knew what Israel ought to do. And nobody really knows what their wisdom uh, entailed. Some say they understood politics. Others say it was science and philosophy. Some say they understood uh, astronomy. Others say scripture. Perhaps it was a combination of all of these things. But the key thing to me is whatever their wisdom was, it was valuable enough to be included in this list of mighty warriors. And to me, the most important part of that verse is that their understanding allowed them to know what Israel ought to do. How many of you get up in the morning and say, I know what I ought to do today? How many of you turn on the news and say, I know what I ought to do in response to this? I, I turn on the news and I'm like, I'm just done, turn this off, I can't watch this anymore. But these guys knew the times, they understood what was going on, and they understood what Israel ought to do. What better people to guide this mighty army? What better people to tell Israel and this army, this is what we need to do, here is where we need to stand. And as I read this verse, I ask myself, where are these brave, mighty, and wise men today? They're certainly not in our national political leaders. Those guys are all off running around doing what they think is right, and they have no idea what's right. Maybe we can find some of these wise men in our local and state leaders, but certainly not enough of them. And what about the church? Where are these men in the church today? Now let's be honest here. Most of us wonder what we should be doing with our own lives. Never mind the church and the community and how to best support and teach our families. But the fact of the matter is, we need this kind of man. We need this kind of man who knows what we ought to do and then has the strength to do it. And perhaps now, more than ever in the history of this country. And so, this has kind of been a running focus with the leadership at Buell for quite a while now. Uh, we've discussed and we've prayed, and we've discussed and we've prayed some more. And we believe that men, that God is asking us to raise up men of Issachar, to equip the men in our church to be the men that God wants them to be, to be the leaders of their family, to be the leaders of the church, to be the leaders in the community. And I'm not saying that none of them are doing that, but I am saying that all of us could do a better job than we do now. We're asking men to step up and accept the leadership role that God has laid out in Scripture for them. This is our challenge to you this weekend and moving forward. We're challenging you to accept what the Bible teaches and then to put it in practice in your life and in your family, in your church, and in your community. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be easy. Since we've started this, this thought process, we have been under spiritual attack like I have never experienced in my life. It's not going to be easy. But nothing worth doing ever is easy, is it? And we will do everything we can to walk alongside you and teach you and help you to become the men that God has called us to be. Amen. So before we, begin, we can begin to talk about becoming godly men, we have to recognize where we are and how we got there. And so I'm going to ask you to listen to this message. It's going to be a little bit different than we're used to. I'm going to ask you to prayerfully consider where you are as a man today. I'm going to ask you to look deep inside yourself and see what things are holding you back. I'm going to ask you to ask God to point those things out to you. And then we're going to ask you to begin to share them 
and to begin to experience healing from those things. This is going to be a no excuse weekend. I want to see all of you guys here at every session. We've got plenty of time for fellowship, plenty of time for meals, and plenty of time for napping. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> but we need to be focused in here in these sessions. And we need, to, we need to begin to do as Lamentations 3.40 says. We need to test ourselves and examine our ways and return to the Lord. So let's talk about masculinity for a minute. Masculinity is a concept in our society that is so confused, it's not even funny. In fact, true masculinity in our country is all but dead. So our culture has pushed masculinity to the side. And true masculinity is biblical and it's God-given. Unfortunately, it's been in a downward spiral for decades. In fact, the, the loss of biblical masculinity started in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis chapter 2, we see that God makes man from the dust of the ground and breathes life into him. Adam is then placed into the garden, and God tells him he may eat from any tree in the garden except the tree of good and evil. God brings all the animals to Adam, and he gives them a name, but in that process, there's not a suitable companion or a suitable helper to be found. So God puts Adam into a sleep, removes his rib, and he creates Eve. Now there's something that, I'm going to share some of the highlights in that chapter, um, but as we go through, I want you to think about this. There's one thing that, that is, to me, amazingly absent from this description of what happens with Adam and Eve in the fall. Nowhere do we see God instructing Eve. He instructs Adam. And nowhere does God warn Adam about what's coming up. We don't see God saying, hey dude, next Tuesday in the garden by the tree of knowledge of good and evil, something bad is going to happen, you need to be ready for it. God doesn't do that, at least not that's recorded. So let's take a look at uh, Genesis chapter 3. And again, I'm just going to bounce around in here, but starting in the first verse, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the fruit that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So let's stop right there for a minute. Did God say they couldn't touch it? No, he didn't, did he? So right here, Eve has confused what God said. And the serpent takes advantage of that. And he says, You will surely not die. She's already confused. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Now that's an important thing that I skipped over for many years, is that when this happened, Adam was standing with Eve. The word that's translated as with her means right alongside of her. So Adam was present when this was going on. And what did he say? He said, give me some of that fruit. So a few verses later, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, now, who sinned first? Eve did, didn't she? Eve took the fruit. Eve ate it. Eve gave it, to, gave it to Adam. Why did God call Adam first? Why did he say, Adam, what have you done? I think it's because God held Adam responsible. Eve was the protector of Adam. Eve was the instructor of Adam, and he failed in his responsibility. Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And then you know the story from there. Then it becomes, no, God, the woman you gave me gave me the fruit, and I ate of it. 
And then the woman says, no, God, the serpent gave me the fruit, and I gave it to Adam. And it just becomes a big spiraling, making excuses, pointing blame, shirking responsibility. Since the fall, men have been hiding from God, blaming others, making excuses, and shirking responsibility. Let's face it, we all do it. When that, when push comes to shove and you're right in the midst of that confrontation or you're right in the midst of that problem, the first impulse is to say, he did it, or she did it, or I didn't know. Fast forward to today, and this situation has gotten much worse. The very idea of masculinity is bad. In fact, it's often called toxic. In order for us to understand what God calls men to be, we need to understand the modern terms and compare them against scripture. So let's talk for a minute about toxic masculinity. This is a, this is a subject that just really irks me. It just makes me so mad. Toxic masculinity is an expression common in popular culture, frequently applied with a bias that goes against the original meaning. The one misused, these two ideas, toxic and masculine, are assumed to be one and the same. Rather than implying an inappropriate concept of maleness, toxic masculinity typically implies that all things masculine are inherently toxic. Originally, toxic masculinity referred to a warped impression of manhood, a distortion of what it meant to be a real man. This unhealthy perspective was associated with hypermasculinity, the cartoonish, stereotypical, he-man or macho man, perpetually scowling, tough, immune to pain or emotions, you know the kind of guy, John Wayne, <laughs> Jason Bourne, you know, I can't be hurt, I don't have to show my emotions. This, this kind of, of uh, stereotype is unfair, it's an unreasonable stereotype of a real man and it was often blamed when men, men felt pressured to do things like suppress emotion, close themselves off to others, overwork, or refuse to admit failure. Originally, the term toxic masculinity was aimed at the misguided perception that real men don't express feelings, don't exhibit gentleness, practice submission, or demonstrate nurture. And so, toxic masculinity originally had a useful, useful word, a term, a useful uh, connotation. But now that has changed to include everything that we think of as maleness in, in our society today. So toxic masculinity has been unfairly applied to men who want to be protectors and providers of their spouse, or to men who behave in ways that were once considered polite like opening doors for women or letting them go ahead of a man, or sometimes to those men who value manual labor or athletics, or even to men who prefer to not be excessively emotional or vulnerable. Traits such as competitiveness, bravery, or even merely being loud have been labeled as expressions of toxic masculinity by modern critics. This criticism is perhaps most damaging when it's leveled against young boys. And we see this happening all the time. Young boys in school are told to be quiet, sit down, do your work, don't make waves. They're trying to, they're, they are forced into a mold that God never intended them to be in. Trying to mold boys into something that weren't, they weren't meant to be creates toxic masculinity rather than preventing it. So the Bible says that everything God created is good when it's used for a good purpose, and that includes God's created pattern of male and female. There is absolutely nothing wrong with masculinity, but there is much wrong with behaviors that are toxic. What separates the two is a matter of application. So, robbing a bank requires a measure of bravery, daring, and risk-taking. But that's toxic, isn't it? But those, those very uh, attributes daring, risk-taking, bravery, are also required of a fireman, or a policeman, or a rescue person. And so we take the things that God created that are good in men, and culture says, these things are bad, you guys got to stop doing this. Every so often I hear someone, usually a woman, say, where have all the real men gone? And I think to myself, 
Society has asked them to be women. The very attributes that God instilled in men, strength, aggression, bravery, boldness, competitiveness, these are the things that society tries to squash. And yet, they are the very thing that society needs. Our country needs men who are strong. Our country needs men who are bold. Our country needs men who will stand up to wrong, who will stand up for the right thing. So let me tell you tonight, I will not apologize for the way God made me. I won't apologize for my strength. I won't apologize for my competitive spirit or my sexuality. I won't apologize for my love of outdoors or guns and knives, and I love those things. But what I will do is every day, I will take these things and pray that they be brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. This is the path to biblical manhood. Our strength, our aggression, our power, those things under the control of the Spirit. And this is what our families and our nation so desperately need. So what does the Bible say about masculinity? Well, first of all, you're not going to find masculinity in, in a normal translation of the scriptures. You might in a message. Uh, but scripture basically debunks all notions of toxic masculinity. It condemns inappropriate behaviors, and it applauds positive ones. And here's the thing. There is no better example of real manhood in the Bible than Jesus Christ. His example not only confronts bad masculine attitudes, but it also shows how it's possible to express supposedly male traits in, excuse me, in a positive way. So let's just cover that real quickly. Jesus was unafraid to show his emotions, and yet he was willing to chase crooks out of the temple with a whip. Christ cared for the needs of others and demonstrated compassion, sensitivity, forgiveness, and humility. At the same time, he exhibited bravery, righteous confrontation, proper judgment, and self-control. This is biblical masculinity. More generally, Scripture talks about those attitudes that are truly toxic. Scripture denounces domineering, greed, refusal to rest, promiscuity, selfishness, arrogance, vengeance, and so on. It promotes the value of love, openness, gentleness, and peace. It promotes strength, bravery, respectability, and boldness. A truly biblical approach to manhood, then, is not toxic, nor should it be labeled as such. And later on, if you want <coughs> scriptures for all those things, I have scriptures I can give to you. And I'm not going to go through each one of them right now. So here's the thing. I think that far too often, we get this picture of Jesus as this meek, mild, gentle soul who loved everybody. And that's true, isn't it? Jesus was meek and mild. And, he, and he was, Jesus is love. But he also wielded great strength and great power. One of my favorite descriptions of Jesus' power is in John 18, verses 4 through 6. And it says this. This is, this is as Jesus is going with his disciples into the garden. He's about to be arrested. And this is what we read. John 18, 4 through 6, it says, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, said to the crowd, let me back up a minute. So the Romans and the Jews sent a cohort of soldiers to take Jesus, to take Jesus and arrest him. Now, a cohort is somewhere around six or 700 men. And plus that, there were temple soldiers and temple guards and priests. And so there was this giant crowd of people who came to arrest one man. What's going on there? So as the crowd comes up, Jesus says to them, Whom do you speak? seek? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Over 700 men, probably armed with swords and shields and who knows what else. Jesus said simply, I am he. And they fell back and fell to the ground. Jesus wielded great power. Mark calls this group of men a great multitude. In C.S. Lewis's classic, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, a character called Susan is having a conversation with the talking beaver. The beaver is telling her about the coming of the great Aslan, 
And that Aslan is a figure who represents Christ. Susan asks the beaver, who is Aslan? The beaver answers, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Susan says, ooh, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall be rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. Does that describe you today? <coughs> it doesn't describe me. But I want it to describe me. I want to be considered as someone who isn't safe, but I'm good. <coughs> if you think our God is safe, then you might want to think again. He is powerful beyond our wildest imagination. He is all-knowing and all-seeing. But safe? Not for a minute. But he is good. He's dangerous in the face of evil and wrathful against sin and woe to anyone who has to feel his wrath. But his power, his wrath, is tempered by mercy and grace. It's but tempered by his goodness. And if we were honest, I suspect each one of us would prefer to be thought in this way. Dangerous, but good. I want to be a man who people know is dangerous in the face of sin. I want to be a man who people look at and say, that guy is going to stand up for what's right. But I also want to be a man that people look at and say, he's good. You don't have to be afraid of his strength. You don't have to be afraid of his anger because he's good. How many of you think of yourselves as dangerous? Sometimes I do when I go out on the range and I have a gun strapped to my hip. That makes me feel dangerous sometimes. But society has tried to mold us into its idea of manhood, which results in what I like to call a nice guy. A nice guy is not dangerous. He does as he's told. He checks off his duties on a list. He's polite. He doesn't make waves. He goes with the flow. He doesn't confront sin because he wants to keep the peace. <clears throat> Guys, all too often this describes our churches. We don't want to confront sin because we want to keep the peace. He doesn't take risks, and he certainly isn't what people would consider dangerous. He's a nice guy. That is, until his frustrations, his anger, his past hurts overwhelm him, and then he turns dangerous. Rage will surface, or an addiction, headaches, an ulcer, maybe an affair. Why does this happen? Because of the unhealed wounds that most men bear. Before we can begin to change the way things are, before we can begin to change the men we are today, we need to address the wounds that we carry. John Eldridge in his book, Wild at Heart, writes this. He says, every boy in his journey to become a man takes an arrow in the center of his heart, in the place of his strength. Because the wound is rarely discussed and even more rarely healed, every man carries a wound, and the wound is nearly always given by his father. Bearing God's masculine image means that we have desires that come from God. The desire for conquest. Remember in the garden, go and subdue the earth. If we're going to just subdue the earth, that's a conquest, that's an adventure. The desire to be a warrior, like the men described in 1 Chronicles. Man, I look at those descriptions and I think, that's what I want to be like. The desire to be used by God in his story, to be swept up by an adventure that's bigger than we are. We get trapped in these mundane lives where we go to our office and we sit in a cubicle and we check things off a list. But there's nothing bigger than us for us to be involved in. The problem is there is something bigger for us, bigger than us, for us to be involved in. And that is God's story and what he's doing in our lives and the lives of our communities. <clears throat> Think for a minute about your favorite movies, the stories, the books about adventure that really stir your heart. The stuff that really gets your blood going. What are some of those movies for you? What's one of your favorite movies? Jason, don't answer this question. The Patriot. 
What is it? The Patriot. The Patriot. Why is why does the Patriot get you worked up? Because uh, the tomahawk scene. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the basic story of the Patriot? Is that he fights for his family and his land. Yeah, he's a good guy who fights for his family. He stands up and he fights and he does the right thing. At whatever the cost is to him. Some of somebody else, what's your favorite movie? Gladiator. Gladiator! Gladiator is one of my favorite movies. Who's your favorite character in Gladiator? <laughs> who said that? Who said Gladiator? I said it. You did. I, I, I don't know. I can't really say. You don't know. I think actually, it's I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, the African. The African guy. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't That's remember supportive. his name. Yeah, he was a good brother too. Yeah. Why is he your favorite? The support. The you know, support. He just he was willing to stand side by side. Right. He was willing to stand up with Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. My favorite scene in the Gladiator. Is when so if you don't know what the story is about, it's a story about this guy who is the, the general of all Rome's armies back in the days when Roman when Rome was big and ruled the world. And so he goes to this battle and the emperor comes to him. The emperor is really old and he's about to die. And the emperor calls him in and says, I want you to take over. I'm I'm gonna die. I want you to be emperor, basically. And this general says, No, I, I can't do this. I'm you know, I'm not qualified, I'm not capable. And he's and he tells the emperor tells him, You're a good man. You're loyal. You know what's right for the people and I want you to be this. I want you to take over the emperor when I die. And the guy says, What about your son? And he's like, My son is a joke, basically. My son is a is a nut job. And so he leaves and the son finds out about this. And the son comes and kills the emperor and takes the ring and tells everybody, as he was dying, he said, you are the new emperor. And then the son takes Marcus Aurelius and he throws him into the dungeon and turns him into, uh, sells him as a slave. So he gets sold into slavery, he goes across the, the, the country and he ends up in a, in a gladiator training camp. But this guy is an amazing warrior to begin with. But in this gladiator training camp, he really hones his battle skills. And ultimately he ends up as a gladiator, gladiator in the Colosseum, playing in the game where the emperor is present. Throughout this whole thing, his only goal in life is to kill the emperor. And the reason he wants to kill the emperor is because the emperor, thinking he was wiping this guy off the face of the earth, had his wife murdered, and his son murdered, and his house burned, and his crops burned. All this guy wanted to do was go home and be with his family. Father figure. Yeah, father figure, exactly. So the best scene in the movie, he's been playing in the, in the games in the Colosseum, and he goes by the name of Spaniard, and whenever he goes into the Colosseum, the crowd starts going, Spaniard, Spaniard, Spaniard. And so they fight this big battle that everybody expects his group is going to die in, and instead they kill everybody else. And the emperor sees this, and he says, I have to meet this person. So he goes down to the Colosseum, and... Marcus Aurelius has a mask on his face. And the emperor comes up and says, Gladiator, what is your name? And, and Marcus Aurelius looks at him and says, My name is Gladiator. And he turns around and walks away. And the emperor says, Slave, how dare you turn your back on me? Get back here. Tell me your name. And he still got his back to the emperor. He takes his mask off and he turns around and he says, my name is Marcus Aurelius, general of the northern armies, uh, servant of a, of a murdered emperor, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will get my revenge in this life or the next. And the emperor is like, he's like terrified of this dude. That, that scene just gets me going. It gets my blood going. Here's a man, a real man. A man who's shown emotion, a man who's been tender towards his family, a man who's been loyal to his country, and he's going to get this guy. Ultimately, in the movie, he does. If you've never seen it, I really recommend it. <laughs> the longing for adventure is bound up in the heart of every man. An adventure is a test of a man. That longing takes different forms. Some people long to be in the outdoors. Some people want to go out and kill an elk. Some people want to climb a mountain. Some people want to get a degree. But 
But the, the thing is the adventure and the test that comes through the adventure. Uh, a man may not feel that he's up to the battle that he knows awaits him. And sometimes that longing for adventure takes a dark turn, as for instance it sometimes does with inner city gangs, and people who turn to crime. But the desire is there. Every man wants to know that he's powerful. So like it or not, there is something fierce in the heart of every man. And though we may fear the test, at the same time we yearn to be tested. And if you've ever truly been tested, you know what I mean. So one day, my son and I, shortly after I got here, I, I moved here from California, don't hold that against me. <laughs> I didn't bring California politics with me. I carry guns and knives. Um, so one day, shortly after I got here, my son said, Dad, we gotta, we gotta go kayaking. So I was like, yeah, okay, something to do with my son. So I went out and bought a kayak, and we kayaked around a couple times, and then like, like it was like October or November, not a good time to go kayaking, by the way. And we said, you know, we got half the day here, let's, let's take the whole day and go out and kayak. So we made this plan that we were going to put in at Centennial Falls in, in uh, Twin Falls, and we're going to kayak to Pillar Falls, carry our kayaks over the land, and kayak to Shoshone Falls and see the falls. Mm -hmm. Pretty good kayaking trip, okay? So we put in the water at 6 o'clock in the morning, and it's like glass. I'm not kidding you. I have pictures. I'll show you if you want to see them. It's like solid, sheer glass. The Prime Bridge is reflected. You can't, in the picture, you can't tell if you turn it upside down, which, which is which. There's, there's like this much mist above the, above the water. Just one of the most gorgeous things I've ever seen. And so we start off. We get to, Prime, or to uh, Pillar Falls. We take our kayaks out of the water, and there's like, at least I haven't found it yet, there's not an easy path over Pillar Falls to the other side of the water. So we were pretty deep by the time we got to the other side. What I didn't tell you is that the weather report said high winds expected at noon. So both of us fairly new to Idaho, we were like, yeah, the winds aren't gonna come down in the canyon. <laughs> <laughs> so we start, we start up towards the falls, and the wind starts to pick up, and guess what? It comes in the canyon. It was blowing so hard, and we're just a couple of knuckleheads. I'm glad he's not here yet. And we're not even thinking. I'm holding my jacket out like this, like a sail, and the wind is just pushing me along towards the falls. So we get, like, the last corner before you get to the falls, and there's, like, no water coming down the falls. They've turned the falls off. I didn't even know they did that. There was like one little trickle coming down. And then suddenly we said, oh, it's really windy down here. So, so we turned around, and the trip that took us maybe three hours from Centennial Park took us almost five hours to get back. There were times when I was paddling as hard as I could, and I'd look at the shore, and I would see myself staying in the same place. Now, Josh has a different kind of kayak. His sits on top of the water, mine sits in the water, so he could get a little more traction, but he was having just as hard a problem. We turned around a bend, and the wind was coming straight down the river. It was literally lifting my kayak out of the water, pushing me backwards, and then slamming it back down. We were soaking wet. We were freezing. We were at the end of our strength. We tried to call Jason, but we couldn't get a call to go out <coughs> from the bottom of the canyon. And we seriously thought that we were going to die. I, I was at the end of my strength. My heart was pounding. Josh kept looking back. He'd take a couple paddles and he'd look back. And he'd take a couple paddles and he'd look back. And I know, I knew then that he was thinking, my dad's going to have a heart attack down here. And I thought I was going to, too. My heart was pounding out of my chest. So we got to Pillar Falls. We crashed out on the, on the ground and we rested there for a little while. And we did something really stupid, because we didn't want to put our kayaks, carry them back over the land. So if you've ever been to Pillar Falls, there's like a rapid groove that goes like this. We did not stay in the kayaks. We tied rope to them and stood on the cliff and tried to guide them through the rapids. We almost got pulled into the rapids, but we didn't. So we got the kayaks back down, we got in them, and we started paddling towards Centennial Falls. 
and the winds really got bad, and neither one of us was making any headway. Josh finally said, let's tie our, canoe, our kayaks together and see if that makes any difference. So we did that, we lashed them together, and I'm, I'm telling you, I was at the end of my strength. But with both of us moving in, in one, one fashion rather than two, we were able to start making some headway. When we finally got to Centennial Park, it was all I could do to pull my kayak out of the water. I did not move for five days after that. When we got home, we sat in the chair, and I almost slept there. It, was, it hurt me so much to move, I almost slept in the chair. I seriously, guys, I'm not kidding you, that is one of the times that I have been the closest to death. I swear I stared death in the face that day. And it was the best day of my life. Seriously. I don't regret it for a minute. It was adventure with my son. I tested myself against nature and I lived. Now if I had died, it would have been a real bummer. <laughs> for my family anyway, not for me. But you see what I'm talking about? It's the adventure, it's the journey, it's the longing for that, because the journey tells us we have what it takes. So at its core, the desire for adventure is seeking an answer to the question every man asks. Do I have what it takes? And you may not ask that out loud. You may not think it in your head. But you got to admit, there's times when you wonder, I don't have what it takes. I'm not going to be able to make it through this. If you doubt this, then consider your childhood. Or take a look at the boys around you. Capes and swords. Camouflage clothes, running, yelling, climbing. These are all the things that boys love to do. Nobody has to tell them to do that. Little boys long to know that they are powerful, that they are someone to be reckoned with. They want to conquer. They want to take over the playground or the neighborhood. Both boys and men need to know that they have what it takes to conquer and excel. And i got to tell you that grandkids are an amazing blessing. Amen. Hmm. And if you just take the time to spend time with your grandkids and really do things with them, you're going to discover things that you probably missed with your own kids. I didn't do this stuff with my son when he was little. I was too busy working and, and getting money to buy things that I thought they wanted. That wasn't really what they wanted. What they wanted was me to be there. So now I'm there with my grandsons, and I spend as much time with them as I can. And so last week, Josh and I were hanging out with his boys at a small playground, and the boys were running around and jumping and climbing, and the women were all inside, so they weren't there to say, don't climb that ladder, don't slide down that slide upside down. Josh and I just let them do whatever they want. His youngest son, Joshua, started chasing his older brother, Jonathan, and they were running around and yelling and screaming, and and Joshua was catching up with Jonathan, and so in an, in an attempt to get away from him, Jonathan climbs up on the, the playground uh, which, uh, toys up to a height of about five feet off the ground. He's like this tall. Five feet off the ground, I would have jumped down from there, and he jumps down. I wouldn't have jumped down from five feet. He just like jumps down while his brother's trying to climb up the other side. I looked at him and I said, whoa, dude! That was dangerous. You are wild. The next day, I was at church, and his mom brought them in to, to go to preschool. And Jonathan comes up to me in the hall, and he looks at me and he says, Papa, am I really dangerous? At five years old, he wants to know if he has what it takes. He can't express it that way yet. But the question is already there. And he hasn't experienced the wounds yet. But they'll come. And so it's critical that we learn how, that he learns now that he is tough and capable and a force to be reckoned with. See, I didn't do this with my kids. I didn't do this with my son. But I'm doing it with my grandsons. And the reason that this is so critical is because the wounds a man takes throughout his life will cause him to lose heart if all he's ever been trained to do is to be good, <coughs> to be soft. 
I counseled a man once, an experienced and accomplished teacher and writer. He seemed to have it all. He had a nice house, a nice car, money in the bank, a retirement plan, respect of his peers. But he was trapped. He was trapped in a marriage that was in distress, in a strong, lifelong addiction to pornography, in hidden fear of discovery, and terrible fear that he was incapable of being the man that God called him to be. He often even would tell me that he doubted that he was saved. As we talked and we spent a lot of time together, I learned about his wound. As a young boy, his father was verbally abusive and not at all affirming. And one day when he was 10, he was in the garage struggling to do a, a task that his dad assigned him that was probably bigger than a 10-year-old's capability. And his dad burst into the garage, pushed him aside, and yelled, Don't tell me you're not finished yet. You're as useless as a girl. And you will never amount to anything in life. Shortly after this, his dad left. Left his, his, him and his brother and his mom. And mom struggled to raise him and his brother, but she had mental issues of her own. And it was very, very difficult. She tried to affirm them, but it was always in ways that were feminine. It was always scolding them for risk they were taking, telling them to be safe, telling them to be smart, telling them to share their feelings, be emotional, cry, things that boys don't want to do. The task proved more than she could handle, and the relationship became codependent. And as my friend got older, she turned to him for the emotional and spiritual support that she should have been getting from a husband. The relationship got really, really weird at that point. Fifty years later, fifty years, his blood pressure skyrockets when a mom calls him, and he often won't answer the phone. And he can still hear his father's voice saying over and over, you will never amount to anything in life. Regardless of the things he's accomplished, regardless of what he has, he still fears that he doesn't have what it takes. His wound went straight to the center of his heart, and it paralyzed him. And the answer to the question, do you have what it takes, for him was no. I don't have what it takes. I'll never be any good to anyone. The wound has made him miserable. The words of his dad became a self-fulfilling prophecy. <clears throat> so each one of us bears some kind of wound. Sometimes we bear multiple wounds. The wounds tell us that we don't have what it takes, we aren't strong, we can't possibly be the men that God wants us to be, we can't take up the mantle of biblical manhood, we can't be the husbands, fathers, or leaders we desire to be. We can't teach our children. We begin to internalize that message. We begin to internalize the no, you don't have what it takes. And then the excuses come. I don't have the time. I'm too busy. There's too much work to do. I don't understand. I'm not smart enough. I'm too sinful to be that man. The wound keeps us trapped. My wound came from my peers. I grew up in a family that was very loving. My dad spent a lot of time with us. We were in Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. And when we got out of that, my dad became involved in, in band at the high school. I was not a band nerd, but my other siblings all were. Uh, he always spent time with us. He always did things with us. But I was a small, you probably not realize it now, but I was a skinny, asthmatic, uh, four-eyed kid. I got my first. But what are you laughing? I was the band. <laughs> I got my first pair of glasses when I was eight years old. And do you know what it's like for kids who get their glasses when they're eight years old? Do you know what it's like for a kid who can't run across the playground because he'll have an asthma attack and fall down gasping for air? Children are miserable to each other. My dad did his best to help me with that. There were days when I was afraid to go to school. And, and I, was, I was this person all the way through until I graduated high school. My dad, though, grew up in a community that was close, in a community where kids were supervised, where kids were taught how to treat one another. And he had no idea how to counsel me to do this. He would tell me, you got to be tougher, Mark. you got to stand up for yourself. 
But he never told me how to do that. He never told me what that looked like. I don't think, honestly, that he knew. We had a great relationship. We still have a great relationship to this day. But he was unable to help me through that. And that woman said to me, nobody's ever going to like you. Nobody's ever going to want to hang out with you. And that, I carried that wound well into my adulthood. It wasn't until I became involved in pornography and I became involved in an affair that things began to change in my life. I sought counseling. I went to Celebrate Recovery. I talked to people about the past. I talked to people about my sin. And I began to see God work in my life to heal me and to move me out of those things. So perhaps your wound didn't come from your father. Maybe you aren't even aware that you have one. Sometimes it'll come to you in cold sweats in the middle of the night, or it'll be there in your deepest, darkest fears, the things that you just don't want to face. But unless your wound has been healed, you either have one or you've been remarkably blessed. I have, in my 12 years in ministry, rarely run across a man who didn't carry some sort of a wound. But in some way, your wound holds you back. And it will continue to do so until it's healed. We cannot be the men that God wants us to be. We cannot be the fathers that God wants us to be until we accept that wound, we grieve that wound, and we heal from it. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the process of healing the wound. Because only then can we accept biblical masculinity. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you would work in us this weekend, that we would recognize those areas that need your touch, those areas that your spirit needs to come into and give us, provide us that healing that will allow us to step out of that wound and into the biblical masculinity that you've called us to. I pray, God, that for those men who don't know what their wound is, that you would speak to them. I pray that you would tell, teach them and show them the things that need to be healed in your life, in their lives. And God, for those men who don't have a wound or have been healed of their wound, I thank you for that. And I praise you for that because those are the men that will be the foundation for us moving forward. First, we need to heal, and then we can become the men that you want us to be. And so, God, work in us and through us that we may glorify you and be the men that you want, that our families and our churches and our communities need. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.